Hi, my name is Steve Miller, Graduate Program Director for the BTEC program and Associate Professor of Biology at UMBC. I'm co-hosting this session together with Dr. Sheldon Bradell, Associate Director of the program and Founder and CEO of Athena Environmental Sciences. I will provide a brief overview of the key elements of the Biotechnology MS program, and then I'll turn the session over to Dr. Brodell, who will provide information about preparing for and finding employment in the biotechnology field. At the end of our presentation, we will answer your questions as they come into us. Here's the essential information on the BTEC program. To earn the Master of Professional Studies, or MPS, in biotechnology degree at UMBC, Students complete 10 three-credit courses for a total of 30 credits. Ideally, students take two courses per term, fall, spring, and summer, and complete the degree after five terms, or a little less than two years. Five of the 10 courses are biology, chemistry, engineering based, while five are management business courses. Two certificates, one in biochemical regulatory engineering and the other in biotechnology management can also be earned either in conjunction with the MPS or independently of it. I don't have time now to go into the specifics of our courses, but that information can be found at the program website, www.umbc.edu backslash biotech. I'd like to emphasize three major advantages of our programs. First, the BTEC MPS program is unique in that it provides students with conceptual and practical know-how in both the science and business sides of the industry. No other MPS and biotechnology program that we know about does this. Second, our curriculum was designed with guidance from local industry experts who told us what they want and need their employees to know and be able to do. And our program is monitored on a yearly basis by an advisory board that includes executives from nearby biotech companies. This means we are teaching the things you need to know to get a position in biotechnology and to or to an advance in this field. Third, our classes are small, generally 10 to 15 students, and are taught by UMBC faculty and by those currently working in the biotech sector. So you get personalized attention and cutting edge instruction from people in the kinds of positions you are training to obtain. The MPS program is geared for several kinds of students. For instance, bench scientists who want to move into the business or management aspects of the biotechnology industry, professionals with science backgrounds who want to enter the biotech field, biotech professionals interested in career advancement, and recent graduates interested in pursuing a career in the biotechnology field. The Certificate in Biochemical and Regulatory Engineering is ideal for students who want to learn about the ins and outs of the FDA approval process and want to explore pre-market considerations that help ensure product approval. The Graduate Certificate in Biotechnology Management is ideal for bench scientists or students who want a good understanding of the business aspects and ethical and legal issues of biotechnology. Now I'm going to hand the presenter role over to Dr. Brodell, who will tell you about employment opportunities in biotechnology and how to find them. Thank you, Steve. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, let me get my screen on here. Yeah, so what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about uh, getting a job in the biotech industry. This is oftentimes challenging uh, for students and early career individuals uh, because oftentimes you don't have a good sense of where the opportunities are and, and how to go about looking for them. So what I'd like to talk today a little bit about what are those opportunities in the biotech industry, where should you look for them, and, and how do you want to engage with the organizations uh, that we, we define as being in the life sciences. And so one of the first things you want to do is exactly what you all are doing right now, and that is uh, listening to, uh, hopefully will be someone will be able to give you sage advice as to what the industry looks like and, and how to approach it from a jobs perspective. So the first thing to do is to uh, learn what is the biotechnology industry? Who are the players? How is it structured? How is it financed? What are the economics? Because in reality, the biotech industry, like a lot of other industries, is driven to a large extent by the economics. You know, where are the dollars coming from and, and how are they flowing? And if you can follow that, uh, you should have a pretty good sense of what's going on in the industry. So 
we define the biotech industry really as three main groups, med bio, ag bio, and industrial bio. And oftentimes when we think of bi biotech, we think in terms of med bio, we're very comfortable thinking about, well, what's the latest drug coming out? Or what's the latest medical device coming out? And, and so human healthcare uh, sort of is, is the focal point oftentimes for discussions regarding the biotech industry. But in reality, there are two other pieces to the biotech industry, the ag bio and industrial bio. And in, in the case of industrial bio is, is almost as big if not larger than med bio in terms of, of total valuation and, and revenue. So collectively, the biotech industry is about a $319 billion revenue. Um, that number moves around a little bit depending on how, how one defines biotech. There are roughly 588,000 employees in the United States in the life sciences, and, 11, and that's represented by 11,000 companies. So it, it's quite a substantial industry. And it's also one that is growing uh, quite rapidly. So the projected uh, cumulative average, uh, annual growth rate over the next five years is projected to be nine and a half percent. So that is quite large if you think about the projected gross, dometric, gross dometric, domestic product growth of being two to three percent and everyone gets excited about three percent, a nine and a half percent growth over the next five years is absolutely phenomenal. How does that translate into jobs? Well, that means that if the industry is growing, there's, a, there's an infusion of cash. Uh, companies use that money to expand their operations, to do new research, develop new products, and in order to get that done, they need new employees. So if you, one expects revenue growth to be about 9.5%, oftentimes job growth runs in parallel to that. So it is a, a growth environment. So one of the things that you want to do when you're looking for a job is look to see where are the jobs, where, where are the life science companies. And, and the reason for this is that life science companies require specialized infrastructure, what we oftentimes refer to as wet lab space. Um, those wet lab spaces are, are, are hard to find, they're expensive to build, so they really end up being developed in, in certain regions. And, and what I show here are um, biospace's perspective on uh, the top U.S. regions for the life sciences. Now, as, as an aside, when you're doing your research about where the life science companies are, uh, some of you will immediately notice that Maryland is not on this list. These lists oftentimes can be very subjective. Um, in this particular case, Biospace, which is a, an organization that does job listings for the life science industry, um, they were looking at a number of different criteria, such as the, 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 the number of patents filed, they're looking at median price incomes, they're looking at employment growth, uh, they're looking at the, the number of companies that are founded over a period of time, and, and so that's where they come out with these lists. The problem with these lists is they, they give you a snapshot, snapshot of what's going on at that moment in time, but you have to take that in context that this is an ever-changing industry and who's on top today may not be on top tomorrow. And a good example in this particular list which came out recently, New York City, Long Island, and Minneapolis weren't even on the list and Maryland was down at the bottom of this list. And now Maryland has fallen off the list and Long Island, Minneapolis, and New York City are on the list. And to some extent, that's because of where the job growth has been over the last five years. Now, it's okay to look at historical data, but, but remember, too, that with an ever-changing and rapidly changing environment, um, you know, where the job growth was yesterday is not where it's going to be over the next five years. Nevertheless, this gives you a sense of uh, the, the, the employment opportunities in terms of the number of employers, you know, thousands of companies versus one or two, and tens of thousands of employees uh, suggest that there's at least opportunities in these regions uh, for life science uh, students. If you take a, a broader view, so this is, this is a, a list that came from uh, Nature Biotechnology. Um, they tend to look at a, at, through a, an international lens, so they, they list the top places where they feel there's going to be uh, annual growth to exceed 10%. Now this was a list that came out earlier this year, 
That was before the the, the Brazilian and Russian economies collapsed, and China then went into this uh, currency panic, and and its economy started uh, collapsing a little bit. When economies start to retract, there's less money for investment. There's less likely to be rapid growth in a cutting-edge field like biotech. So while this list was current six months ago, it has to be taken within the caveat that uh, economies change, and Brazil and Russia right now are not pouring a lot of money into biotech. In fact, Brazil has cut its R&D expenditures almost by by 20 to 30 percent. So they're going to fall off the list the next time it comes out. But the point is that the biotech industry is global. It is growing globally, and you as students uh, or early career individuals in, in the industry uh, need to take a much broader view of where the opportunities are in biotech. And if you work for one of the larger companies, there's an awfully good chance that you may start in the U.S. and you're going to end up somewhere else. Um, through your career, you're going to bounce around from one country to the other because that's, that's just the way the industry works right now. And, and don't be bashful. Look at it as an adventure. Uh, by and large, the United States is still the biggest uh, investor in, in biotech. We're still the global R&D leader by quite a bit, well, well over, almost twofold over China. Um, China is retracting a little bit, as I said, but in the U.S., uh, investment in biotech companies is actually uh, increasing. In 2015, it's looking like it's going to be a, a much better year than 2013 and 14. So there's a lot more money pouring into the industry. So while in some segments it's been stagnant uh, for the last five years, that it, that trend is changing. Um, but this uh, slide on the left gives you a, a sense of, of how much money is being poured into the research and development aspect. Um, and and it's, it's quite a lot of money. Uh, we're talking almost a, a, a trillion dollars uh, annually going into the life sciences globally. On, on the right, I'm giving you, this is a slide, and, I, and to be honest with you, I forget exactly what uh, area this represented, but it, but it points out that companies are divided into four major categories, large, medium, small, and micro. Large companies have um, thousands of employees, mid-sized companies are somewhere between 500 and 2,000, small companies are, are somewhere in the 200 to 500 employee range, and the micro companies have less than 100 employees. And you'll notice that there's a lot more micro companies than there are large companies. And that's true for a lot of high-tech fields. Um, people have ideas, they start companies, and those companies get gobbled up by the big guys. Um, but from an employment standpoint, the larger companies have more employees and the smaller companies have fewer employees. So if you're out there looking for a job, um, you have to first make the decision, do I want to go with a big company or a little company? They, have, they both have advantages and disadvantages, and you really need to decide what's best for you. Uh, but if you're going to go for small companies, then you're going to have to pursue many of them because they don't do a lot of hiring in their early days, uh, whereas the larger companies always have employment opportunities. They're always looking for somebody because they always have some degree of staff turnover. Um, they, they maybe have acquired an, another company and they need to bring in staff to operate that new technology and so forth. So larger companies tend to have a constant need for em, um, employees. Uh, whereas smaller companies, they're a little bit more, um, we need it now, but we might not hire for another two years. So when you're looking for a small company opportunity, you have to look at a lot more companies as compared to uh, with the larger company. Now if we drill down, and I know a lot of you are, are in the Maryland, D.C. area, so if we drill down and say what's going on in the life sciences in Maryland, and, and if you look at total employment, and these are 2014 numbers which are, are, were available, there's about 36,570 private sector jobs in Maryland in 2014. Now that's um, 
that should have put us on the biospaces list, and but I'll come to why Maryland didn't end up on biospaces list. But nevertheless, uh, there's quite an employment sector in the life sciences in Maryland, and layered on top of the private sector uh, is the public sector, and that's places like the the NIH, the FDA, Walter Reed, uh, USDA, the government research uh, institutions that are are part of the U.S. government complex around the D.C. area adds to that. So there's almost 42,000 uh, life, life science jobs, biotech jobs in the state of Maryland. And you'll notice that most of those jobs are in research and development. Almost two-thirds are in some form of research and development. And the next two categories, testing, medical diagnostics, and pharmaceutical and, and medicine manufacturing, uh, take up the, the, the lion's share of the rest. And you'll notice that this is almost 90% are technical-oriented uh, jobs. So the largest opportunity is going to be on the bench science side, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. Um, there's about 2,100 businesses in the state of Maryland. Um, when you actually drill down and look at you know, what are those companies? I'll show you the top 10 in a, in a minute. Um, but a lot of those companies are actually quite small. Some of them are running virtual, meaning uh, they have a technology, they have some founders, but they don't have employees and they don't have laboratory spaces. So when I say that you need to do your homework, you need to understand what these 2100 companies are doing because it doesn't make any sense for you to waste your time sending a resume to a company that's operating as a virtual company uh, because they're not in hiring employees, right? So doing your homework means understanding uh, what the companies are doing, how they're doing their employment, uh, where is their financing coming from? Because if they don't have financing, they're not doing much of anything. So. Yes, there are 2,100 companies in, in the state of Maryland, but not all of those companies. In fact, about 60% of them are likely not to be doing any hiring. So you really want to focus your attention on, on those uh, 40, 30 or 40% who are going to be doing hiring. And, and so this slide also shows you that you know, total wages is, is $4 billion. It's a, it's a substantial uh, uh, industry in, in the state of Maryland. And it's got, you know, uh, an average salary of 97000 which gives those of us that are, are CEOs that have to hire people a tremendous amount of angst because that's a lot of money. Um, but more realistically, entry-level people can, can figure uh, the, the numbers that I've posted here. So if you have a bachelor's degree, it's about 35000 plus or minus. Master's degree is about 52, and a PhD is around 72. And that's going to vary a little bit. Larger companies are going to pay a little bit more. Smaller companies are going to pay a little bit less. Um, but smaller companies will offset that lower compensation by giving you stock and equity in the company, whereas larger companies are less likely to do that. So there's trade-offs. But this is, gives you a rough idea of, of where folks will be um, at entry level. Uh, but you can see that it's uh, almost a $15 billion a year uh, industry in the state of Maryland. So that's quite substantial. So where are the employment? Well, there's basically uh, four categories in Maryland, research, testing in medical laboratories, drugs and pharmaceuticals, medical devices and equipment, agricultural feedstock and chemicals. Uh, this is all private employment. Now, you can see that you know, then uh, these are slightly different numbers than the previous slide, and here's one of the challenges you always face. Don't sweat the details. Um, there's about 35 to 36,000 employees in the life sciences. One of the problems is that different databases define diff companies differently. So in one database, a company may be considered a life science company, and another it might not. So those numbers will vary a little bit, but they're not going to vary by orders of magnitude, all right? It's just going to be a few. But what you can see in the state of Maryland that historically job growth has been fairly slow over the last few years. Now, putting that in context of what's going to happen in the next five years because 
for those of you that are looking for jobs, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. What matters is what's going to happen in the future. And if you look at how the industry has changed in Maryland, there has been uh, a sort of a, a the, the last few years have been a readjustment of the focus of companies in Maryland. And where there has been growth, and there will continue to be growth over the next few years, is companies that are providing the services to all the other companies that are running virtual. So in other words, companies doing contract manufacturing, contract research, um, the medical testing laboratories, those companies are on the upswing. And as more investment dollars are flowing into those virtual companies, those startups, they need to have services done. And where are they getting them done? They're getting them done here in the state of Maryland. So a lot of the companies like Paragon Bioservices and Emergent Biosolutions, uh, BioReliance, those companies are, are seeing an uptick in business. Their revenues are growing. Those are the companies that are more likely to be hiring people. Um, so as investment dollars flow into the state of Maryland, I would expect to see these employment numbers start to rise. And in fact, uh, when I was preparing this, this talk, I, I queried some of my colleagues, and a lot of them are anticipating uh, adding a lot of staff uh, over the next um, 12 to 18 months. Um, a lot of them are, are saying that they're going to increase staff by about 10%, which to me was kind of an astounding number because that that is significant uh, growth in the in the industry that's likely to occur over the next uh, year or two. So here here are the top ten employers uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, these folks are these companies are are always have job openings uh, at various levels with various skill set requirements. Um, but these are the companies to watch for. They're all growing. Uh, they're all increasing. Certainly, those that that are in the contract research um, and and uh, you know clinical trials support um, companies like Weststat and Lidos, uh, Quest Diagnostics. Those companies are seeing a significant uptick in in activity. Uh, similarly, uh, MedImmune, which is owned by AstraZeneca, a couple of years ago, AstraZeneca made the decision to uh, move all of its biologics development work to the state of Maryland. So that 2,290 is actually a small number now. They're up over 3,000. So MedImmune has been on a hiring spree. Um, uh, likewise, um, uh, Pharmaceutics International, uh, they've gone from about 48 employees to 480 or 500 employees over the last 10 years. So they've they've grown by leaps and bounds. Um, GlaxoSmithKline wasn't even here a couple of years ago. They just recently moved into the area with a large contingent of folks. So again, going back to you've got to do your homework because you have to understand who's in the industry, who are the players, what are they doing. How are they growing? Where's their financing? Do they have clinical products coming out? Do they have products coming out? And are those products growing and getting traction in the marketplace? Those are the growth companies. Those are the companies that are going to have employment growth, and that's where you want to focus your attention. So the employment opportunities with all of these organizations, whether they're in Maryland or elsewhere, with a biology degree, biochemical degree, chemistry degree, any kind of sort of life science related degree, BS, MS, PhD, the, the primary employment opportunities are going to be in the laboratory sciences. That includes basic research, applied research, development, product development, you know, manufacturing, and quality control. So all of the functions that go into basically a life science product um, it's, 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 an, it's a bench science, uh, whether it's at a, at a small bench or a big bench as in manufacturing. Um, it, it's, you're on the technical side, and that's where most people in this industry will get their start in their career. And then progress over to the business side, and oftentimes making that transition from 
the technical science side of things, so the business side, requires advanced training. And that's where degrees like UMBC's MPS degree comes into play, uh, where you get training, academic training and experience in some of these uh, management side things, regulatory, project management, intellectual property, marketing, sales. Uh, you don't jump out of a BS degree directly into intellectual property. That requires some years of experience, extra training, uh, additional uh, background in that focuses on that area. So that's where the, the BS to MS degree um, is really important because the, M the master's degree that you select will help you track whether you want to stay in the science or go into the business. But the opportunities are out there and, and I'll show you uh, in a minute where those opportunities are and how competitive they are. So let's look at in the, in the top five growing fields in the past five years were medical science, project management, bioprocess engineer, bioanalytics, and bioinformatics. These subject matter areas were where the largest amount of hiring was taking place and where companies were having a difficult time uh, finding individuals with those skill sets. That's the past five years. Today, it's changed. Uh, today's top five growing fields are biomedical engineer, medical science, biochemistry and biophysics, epidemiology, and microbiology. That's because the industry, as I've said earlier, is constantly changing, shifting, and moving. As opportunities come up, uh, new opportunities are, take, uh, are exploited. A good example of why microbiologists is coming to the forefront now, and it had, had sort of languished for a number of years, is we've got a serious infectious disease problem. We've got a lot of infectious diseases that are becoming uh, resistant to um, the, the current uh, portfolio of antibiotics that are available um, and, and those individuals are presenting in the clinic with, with multiple drug resistant uh, infections and we've run out of antibiotics in, in, in some cases and, and so the microbiologist is being called on to help develop the next generation uh, therapeutics for infectious disease. Likewise, Five years ago, no one ever heard of a microbiome, let alone realizing how complex it was and how integrated it was into um, what it means to be a human being, at least you know, from, from a cellular standpoint. Uh, companies are now starting to pop up to take advantage of the knowledge that's been gained in understanding what that microbiome is all about, and those are all being driven by microbiologists. So as the technology advances, and industries then step in to take advantage of that new knowledge, the expertise required changes. What that means is that what, you, what you're learning today is likely to be obsolete tomorrow, which means you better be prepared for a lifetime of learning. Uh, and again, this is where uh, advanced degrees like the MPS degree or, or an MS degree come into play because you need to constantly be updating your skills. You can't just say, oh, I have a bachelor's degree, I'm done, uh, I'm going to be happy as can be. No, because the industry is going to get ahead of you and you need to be able to keep up with it. So as I say, tomorrow stay tuned because it's hard to predict what, what the hot jobs of tomorrow are going to be. So be prepared. So when you're out there looking, where are the most competitive jobs. Well, if you look at this, this slide, which was prepared by Biospace uh, a couple of years ago, um, the most competitive jobs are all in the research field. Well, that makes sense because this is a, this is a, a science-driven industry, and so it makes sense that most of the job opportunities, as well as most of the competition, is going to come from uh, the, the science side of things. And you can see that by the job titles here, uh, that if you're looking for a job in science, you're going to be competing against a lot of people. And so how do you differentiate yourself is very important. And I'll speak to that in a little bit. But one way of doing it is look at the job opportunities where there are very few applicants. Because doesn't it make better sense to prepare yourself for a career in a field where there are fewer competitors? 
that seems to make some sense. So in this case, uh, regulatory affairs, quality, quality systems, quality control, um, clinical trials management, you'll see those sorts of terms popping up in this slide, which is looking at where, the, where less than 20 applicants per job opening. And as it turns out, UMBC's MPS degree kind of focuses on some of these areas. And in fact, a lot of our graduates uh, from the program are finding jobs in these different areas, in clinical trials, in, in project management, regulatory affairs, quality systems, and, and, and such. And, and that advanced training is allowing them to then make the transition from a science career into more of a management career. So how do you find these opportunities? Well, the first thing you want to do is start with a quality resume and cover letter. And, and I've given you a link here at www.umbc.edu slash biotech slash masters dot php. At that website, you, at that web page, you'll be able to find a downloadable template for a resume. Now that template is going to look very different than what a lot of uh, uh, career development advisors or career placement advisors will show you. It, it is a, it's a little bit different format, but it is a format that, that we have devised that we know attracts attention in our industry. The biotech industry, for whatever reason, uh, people that are, are doing the hiring are, are looking for a certain kind of format, and this is a tried and true approach. It's a little bit different than, than what's traditional resume looks like, um, but trust me, it works. I've used it on um, a lot of students that have come through my lab, um, and it gets them a job every time. So it really works, so, so take it seriously. Um, you want to create yourself a LinkedIn profile. Uh, LinkedIn is a social networking site for professionals but make it realistic. I mean, if you have just a bachelor's degree and little or no experience, don't overblow or, or over expound on your academic, uh, you know, your teaching lab experience. Uh, industry doesn't look favorably on that. So, you know, what exploits you put down on your LinkedIn page, make them realistic uh, for your level of expertise and background. Um, you want to fix any online embarrassments. Um, you know, in this day and age, uh, employers can get online, and I know you hear this over and over and over again, uh, but employers can get online, and by one way or another, they can, they can find embarrassing things about you. So, you know, search your name and <laughs> make sure that, you know, your friends aren't posting um, inappropriate pictures of you on their Facebook page because, you know, an employer may not be able to get to your page, but they might be able to get to your friend's page, and that can be embarrassing. So you know, be prudent in your use of, uh, of social media. Get experience. The sooner the better. If you're an undergraduate, get in an academic lab, get yourself into a research lab as, as soon as you possibly can. Um, you know, I'd like to see, you know, in the ideal world, I'd like to see every sophomore in a research lab. That's not always practical, but, but the reality is that it, in, in this industry, experience trumps an academic degree. So the sooner you can get experience, the better off you're going to be. However, don't go to a company and ask to volunteer. Companies cannot take on volunteers. I get this all the time. Oh, I know you can't afford to pay me, so I'll volunteer. Well, there's a lot of legal issues involved in that, and technically it's actually illegal for us to do that. Um, so we, you know, industry can't take on people without paying them. So, so please don't even ask. Um, look for companies that have the wherewithal to be able to to, to pay you. Um, there's lots of companies out there that are willing to do internships, um, part time or full time. So it, it's really just up to you to to keep looking. Search for positions on multiple sites. Don't rely on Monster.com. Um, you know, they, they, they do a good job listing things, but they're not the be-all, end-all. Uh, look at the local advocacy groups. One, one in here in Maryland is the Maryland uh, uh, Biotechnology Center. 
they they publish a monthly newsletter and every month in that newsletter there are three companies listed who are looking for uh, um, uh, um, they have employment opportunities uh, you can look back through all of their uh, their past um, um, newsletters and you can find um, links to the companies that are, are, are act actively seeking uh, staff. Look at bio.org, Nature Jobs, Biospace, LinkedIn. All of these online resources uh, should be pursued because if you look at them, you'll, you'll find that what's posted on, on Nature Jobs is not necessarily posted on Monster or Biospace. Um, companies cherry pick. Uh, they have to pay for this these advertisements. So they're not going to broadcast broadly. Um, they're 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 going to they're going to be selective. So you you have to you have to do your homework and, and look across a broad broad spectrum of, of online resources, including company websites. And finally, follow the money. If a company does not have financing, if a company does not have revenue, it can't pay its staff. So in very simplistic terms, if you can understand where the money is flowing, who is it flowing to, those are the companies that are more likely going to be looking for staff. Um, when you're reading in, in the newspaper or, or on the newsletter from, from uh, the Maryland Biocenter, look at those, those uh, press releases. Who's raised $20 million, $30 million, $40 million? Send your resume into those companies because they're going to be looking for staff. They don't raise money and then not do anything with it. They're going to do something with that money, and oftentimes it's having to bring in staff. So look for those organizations that, that have raised money or they've, they've just gotten FDA approval or they've done a deal with a major pharma company. Those are the folks that are going to be hiring. So some strategies, remember that, that looking for a job nowadays is a full-time job. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, if you send out 10 resumes, you haven't done enough. Uh, I recommend in this day and age that you ought to be up around two or 300. Um, it's just the way it is these days. Uh, you, you've got to be out there in front of a lot of folks. Understand the market, the status, the trends, where are things going, where's the money flowing, that sort of thing. Do your homework. Keep current with online listings, the company listings, the online databases. They change on a regular basis, so keep current. Give you, set yourself a, a time schedule. You know, every Sunday afternoon while I'm watching a football game, I'm checking out. You know, it doesn't. It's not complicated, um, but you ought to be, you know, keeping current with the new postings that are coming out. Um, identify companies which have recently closed on financing, launched a product, received regulatory approval. I've already said this, but I, I'm going to repeat it. It's, it's again, follow the money because those are the organizations that are going to have the resources to be able to pay employees. Uh, and never geographically restrict yourself. The biotech industry moves and swings and changes. California has been a hotbed. Maryland used to be third. It fell off a little bit. Maryland is coming back because investment dollars are flowing in. San Francisco has gotten so expensive that a lot of biotech companies, uh, Amgen in particular, has started to move its, its research facilities to other places. In, in Amgen's case, they're building a building in, in Cambridge, Mass, right outside of Boston, uh, right next to MIT, because their employees can't afford to live in South San Francisco anymore. So it moves, it changes, it morphs, uh, stay abreast, and don't restrict yourself to one area. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you for listening in. Um, uh, we'd like to entertain as many questions as we can, uh, and I'll remain on the line and answer them as best I can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brodell, for a very informative presentation. Okay, so we've had some questions that have come in offline as well as online. So um, it's a point of information that's been asked whether or not this PowerPoint will be made available to participants. And yes, if you would like a copy, ask us and we'll be happy to email that to you. Okay, so one question, um, Sheldon, that comes in is, why do you say that someone should target just a smaller company or just a larger company when looking for a biotech job? Well, not necessarily target one versus the other, but the, the environment of a small company and a large company are quite different. Um, 
Smaller companies um, are, are higher risk. Um, they may be, they're here today and, and, and may be gone tomorrow. So you have to balance, um, you know, what's your, your, your comfort level with uh, the potential for a lot large turnover. If you go with a small company that doesn't make it, you have to be willing to move to the next one. That, that sort of dynamics, changing, risky environment is not for everyone. You have to have the right kind of personality for it. Resources are oftentimes limited in small companies. Um, you have to be comfortable with doing that. On the other side of the coin, though, uh, smaller companies offer greater advancement opportunities because if they are successful and they do grow, you're, you're, you're going to have a much more responsibility at, a, at an earlier stage in your career than you would with a larger company. The larger companies have lots of resources, but they tend to pigeonhole people. You're, you're hired to do a specific job, and then moving out of that job is a little bit more constrained. Uh, but it's more comforting because you're likely to have that job for a long period of time. So it really is where's your comfort zone in terms of what kind of culture that you want to be uh, in, employed in. Okay. So. Um a question, another question is, what advice would you have for a senior undergrad who hasn't been able to get into a lab to gain experience? And I think I could handle this one as someone who has a laboratory in the Department of Biological Sciences at UMBC. And so my best advice is that sometimes, unlike the case in industry where it's not possible to get a volunteer position in biology labs at universities, it is, and it's really a good way to to get a foot uh, in the door, to get some experience, and then to hopefully parlay that into the opening that one would need in a biotechnology job. Okay, another question that's come in is, um, how does one determine whether a company is virtual or real? Ah, good question. Um, Oftentimes, what you can do is on, on, on their, their website, uh, they'll list a street address. Um, Google the street address and look to see where it is. Um, what happens sometimes is that street address is actually someone's residence. I've, I've found that quite frequently. Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's an address uh, that, that corresponds to the venture capital firm that, that funded the organization. Uh, and other times it's an office building that does not have wet lab space. So in those cases, when you when you Google the address, that's the simplest way of doing it. Google the address and find out what kind of a facility are they working out of. Um, and if it's if it's an office building or a private residence, then they're likely not hiring uh, you know scientists to, to to do development work. Um, the other way of looking at it is um, you can look at the Maryland Bio Centers. Um, uh, listing, they'll list how many employees they have. Uh, if they have one or two employees and they don't list any job openings, they're probably running virtual or semi-virtual. Um, so those are just some of the things that you can do. Uh, if you want to get more sophisticated, uh, you can actually call them up and ask. <laughs> and they're not, they're not afraid to answer that question. Okay. Um, Another question, you say we should do our homework on companies. What's the best, easiest way to do that? All right, so start, start by doing an online search for the company. Most, most companies um, that, 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 that want to have a public face will have a, um, a website of some sort. Um, so the first place to look is, what is their website? Um, what kinds of information are they posting on the website? Uh, then look at see, you know, oftentimes they'll post uh, who the principals of the company, who the founders, with, who's their scientific advisory board, who's their, so you can get a, a sense of who is the CEO, who's the CSO. You can then search those people, and if it's a scientist, they've oftentimes published what they've been working on. You can learn a lot more about the science behind the company. And then the third place to look is the patent filing. So. Once you know who the individual is, and you know the company, excuse me, you can you can search uh, for that individual in a patent search. You can search for that company in a patent search, and you can get a sense of what their technology looks like. Um, 
then beyond beyond what's in those public domains, it's then then it's a little bit more guesswork because uh, you have to sort of extrapolate from what they tell you to where they're likely to be at that point in time. So the easiest thing to do again is go to their website. Um, uh, companies will post a lot of information about who they are, what they're doing, because they're trying to attract attention. From there, you can look at um, scientific and trade publications and then the patent literature to learn more about the companies. Okay. Next question. As someone with entry-level experience, two-plus years in an academic research lab, Johns Hopkins, and earning an MS in biotechnology management this December, what is the best way to make the transition from bench work to the business side with little to no business experience? It seems as though employers really want experience two to five years for even entry level business type jobs. <laughs> Which is kind of strange. That's an entry level position. They want two to five years experience. So that's technically not an entry level. So uh, this is the challenge um, that a lot of students face. And, and so my, my best advice there is to look for the lar larger organizations. Small, smaller organizations are running very fast and they don't have time to train people. So it's much more difficult as an entry level person to get a job with a small company, particularly if you're making the transition from science to business. Because small companies need experience first. The larger companies have a little bit more flexibility and are more willing to hire entry level folks and put them through an on-the-job training program. So my strategy in that case would, be, would I would recommend looking at the larger companies, the, the Metamunes, uh, the Quest Diagnostics, the BDs, uh, and keep after them. Uh, and even if they say, when you look at a job uh, and it says entry level, two to five years experience, put your resume out anyway, um, because you never know whether you'll, 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 what you're trying to do is get that interview. Um, and the best way to, to get the interview is just put it in. Don't ever restrict yourself if they say two to five years and you've got, you know, you have two to five and you have, you, you have zero to two in the bench and no business management, that's okay. Put it in anyway and see what happens. But there the strategy is going to be focus on the larger companies uh, who are going to be more likely to hire an early career person than, than the early startups which really need more experienced people uh, in their early days anyway. Okay, and then an add-on question from the same asker is also, would you not suggest Indeed.com as a resource for job searching? Which, Indeed.com? Indeed.com. Not familiar with that one, to be honest with you. I, okay. I, so I can't, I can't really comment on that site. Okay. Next question, I'm not sure we have a crystal ball for this, but it says, how can we predict what might be top growing fields two to three years from now? <laughs> Okay, there, there actually is a good crystal ball for this. Um, look at the literature um, in, a, in a particular field. If the number of publications is rising exponentially, that's a hot field. And that's, that's the way um, the, the, the crystal ballers in the industry, folks like Stephen Brill and, and his company, which, which tries to predict where the biotech industry is going, um, they'll actually look at subject matter and, and how often does a particular search term, like if, if one uses like nan nanotechnology, um, you know, about 15 years ago, uh, there were very few publications on nanotechnology and then suddenly it started, the number of publications started rising uh, that use that. that was, that's a clear indication of an emerging technology. Um, microbiome is the other one that, that didn't exist about uh, six or seven years ago, and, and now there's hundreds of publications a year. So, so look for to, to predict what's going to be hot in the future. Um, look at it, look at what's going on today. What's being published in the top tier journals? Things like Nature Biotechnology, Nature Science, Cell, places like that, and 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 look at those keywords and and look to see how often that occurs in the literature. Uh, and if there's only 10 publications last year and there were 100 this year, you probably have a growth on your hands. Okay. And kind of related to that question, what tools do you recommend in order to follow the money? 
Ah, so again, these are the trade publications like Nature Biotechnology, Chem Engineering News, uh, Genetic Engineering News. If you just follow those three publications alone, um, they they have articles every month. Um, or Chem Engineering News is every week. Um, they talk about uh, where the money is flowing. Nature Biotechnology, in particular, uh, they take a global view, uh, but every quarter they 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 uh, they have a, an article about uh, venture capital funding in the life sciences globally. So um, that's that's sort of the first tier. Uh, the second tier uh, are organizations like uh, the Maryland Bio Center. Uh, they they publish a newsletter, and in those newsletters are links to press releases of companies that have uh, announced financing. Because whenever a company gets financing, they always send out a press release. All right, next question. I'm getting a PhD in biology. Would it make sense for me to take some courses in a biotech MS program now, or should I wait until I graduate, then enroll in a biotech MS program if I'm interested in getting into the biotech industry? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, my, my advice would be take them sooner rather than later. Um, if you're a PhD and, and you're going to be entry level in, in some biotech company, you're not going to have time to take classes <laughs> right away. You're going to be in your career for a couple of years. Uh, you want to be able to focus on getting yourself established with that organization without burdening yourself with it, uh, more degree work. So my advice would be to get some of those management degrees in before you, you graduate. Um, and I think you'll be in a better position at that point. Okay. And then possibly our last question. So in terms of experience, does it matter what kind of research experience I get? No, no, absolutely not. Um, it, what, what kind of experience that you do get will oftentimes set you up for certain opportunities. Um, but an early career, uh, most employers are going to say, well, you're not going to be an expert. I, I'd like to see you, you know, with some basic laboratory skills because I don't want to have to teach you from the ground up. Uh, so the kind of experience you get is, is less important than experience, than, than, than not having it. Okay. So I think that's all the questions we have. And I want to thank all of our attendees for participating. And we would love it if you could now complete the survey form at the end of the webinar. Mm -hmm.